Yeah, no, thank you, uh, thank you, Nicola, for arranging this. I, is microphone on? It's on no? for the record, ah, okay. not for the... Okay, but you, you hear me all right? Yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, so thanks very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, and uh, have an opportunity to speak about my work. Um, so, so the story will be basically about explaining what you know what what this is. Uh, it's um, you know it's an old problem posed in atomic physics uh, in the early days of quantum mechanics, and um, and then uh, somehow uh, without much progress, uh, you know, it persisted until until graphene um, came to the rescue. Um, and um, so that's uh, that's the story in one sentence. But l let me okay. So let me start with explaining what collapse, atomic collapse is. Actually, even before that, l let me talk about uh, what atomic collapse is, is not. So so this is you know atomic collapse, but the wrong one. But uh, I will t talk about it because uh, that's the first time we'll uh, the first thing we will think about uh, when atomic collapse is mentioned. Uh, it's not the one I'm going to discuss, but you know we will talk about it anyway. So, so when we uh, when we study quantum mechanics, we the first thing we learn is that uh, c classical mechanics cannot stabilize uh, an atom made out of two point charges because positive and negative charge will rotate around each other, radiate, lose energy, and and um, uh, fall on each other, and the time for that is very short. Uh, and that was the main problem, one of the main problems of atomic theory that quantum mechanics cured, uh, cured by, uh, by um, finding out that uh, atomic radii, uh, radii of atomic orbits are quantized because of angular momentum quantization, and that, ang and that uh, is, is expressed through uh, Bohr's uh, formula for energies, energies of the atoms. Uh, one can also explain it in a slightly more intuitive way uh, using Heisenberg uncertainty relation. Uh, one can say that if we take an energy of an electron uh, in the field of a proton, uh, then it's a sum of kinetic energy and potential energy, and, uh, and potential energy for an electron cloud of size, size r is negative 1 over r, potential energy p square, uh, kinetic energy p square over m I can express using Heisenberg uncertainty relation as 1 over r square with a suitable coefficient and then if you you know if you add the two uh, the you know function of r that you get will, will be will be diverging at short distances because because you um, have to pay a lot of kinetic energy if you compress electron cloud to short distances uh, and then at large distances it will be dominated by negative 1 over r uh, and so the, as, as a result there will be an optimal radius somewhere here uh, where these two terms are balanced and that's, that's, the, uh, that's the Bohr's radius and that's, that's how, so the atom, uh, atom likes to be here and that's, that's how it's stabilized, right? So that's, that's the uh, atomic theory in one slide. Okay, so now uh, a collapse. Uh, uh, so that, you know, that that's the classical collapse that uh, that uh, quantum mechanics takes here, takes care of. And as we just mentioned, uh, classically we see collapse, and then quantum mechanically it's stabilized. Right uh, now, the actual collapse that will interest us will be a different one. So it occurs. I mean, you can also start classically and explain it on a purely classical level. Uh, by thinking about relativistic uh, problem of two charges orbiting each other, if you so if you solve that um, two charges positive and negative going around each other and do it in a fully fully relativistic fashion, uh, then you discover that instead of Kepler type orbits that you know that allow for indefinite precession, there are two kinds of orbits. There are orbits. Uh, which go around uh, you know, p p positive charge indefinitely that look like rosettes, and then there are also orbits that uh, on which a particle spirals on on the um, on the uh, other particle and and c c cl collapses in a fi finite time, and these two these two regimes are separated uh, by the angular momentum value. So this angular momentum value for for this particle. 
uh, if it's larger than certain thresholds, then it's a stable orbit. If it's smaller, it's this spiraling, collapsing orbit. And, uh, and that's the condition derived by, problem solved condition derived by Darwin, uh, this grandson of the Darwin, the biologist, uh, and published, you know, even before quantum mechanics appeared. Uh, and that's an interesting point. Uh, another interesting point, more relevant for our discussion, is that uh, this threshold set an angular momentum uh, has no dependence on the mass of the particles. So whether the particles are light or heavy, uh, the threshold for collapsing versus non-collapsing behavior is the same. It's just set by, uh, by uh, angular momentum and the strength of uh, uh, attracting potential. Z, Z is, the, uh, Z is nu nuclear charge. Uh, ZE is nuclear charge, right, and C is the speed of light. Okay, uh, so if you now try to handle this in the quantum mechanical fashion the same as we did here, uh, take kinetic energy and potential energy at the map, then, uh, then you discover that an interesting thing, because for, for a relativistic particle, kinetic energy scales linearly with momentum at very, uh, at very high momenta, uh, when momentum is, is ultra-relativistic, uh, the, and if you estimate momentum as h bar over, over radius, then you get 1 over r for kinetic energy and also negative 1 over r for potential energy. If you add them up, then, uh, then you get, uh, you, you get uh, a curve th th that, a curve that you know, uh, looks like that if, if kinetic energy dominates and like that if potential energy dominates. So, um, so uh, so in this case, when potential energy dominates, uh, it is clearly beneficial to, to shrink electron cloud to, uh, to a very small radius, and the smaller, uh, smaller it becomes, the more energy you gain. And, uh, and so that's, that's the you know, collapsing behavior in, in a quasi-classical quasi quantum mechanics uh, language. That's the collapsing behavior that we, that we obtain here. And so they, they are separated by, 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 this, by this threshold. And uh, yeah, so then the question is what, you know, what, what actually happens if you solve, uh, solve quantum mechanics uh, in, in, in full as Dirac did. And uh, so the Dirac solution for hydrogen atom actually uh, um, is in full agreement with what we just said. Uh, the, for example, this is the answer for the lowest energy state over hydrogenic, uh, over hydrogenic uh, relativistic uh, atom. So it's nuclear, you know, nuclear charge Z and electron with mass M described by Dirac equation orbiting around it. Uh, solving solving uh, Dirac equation, Dirac found energy value that was a function of Z, the dimensionless, couple, uh, dimensionless uh, charge strength z is squared divided by h bar c, and uh, so this is you know this is nothing but fine structure constant e square over h, h bar c is one over 137. Uh, so this parameter zeta that appears here under the square root will be smaller than one if z is smaller than 137 or greater than one if z is greater uh, 137. And so you see that as a function of z and nuclear charge uh, the uh, quantity under square root will go from positive to negative when z becomes equal to 137, and then at this point, uh, the Dirac atom uh, energy become complex valued, and uh, that means that the operator Dirac operator sees as you know being Hermitian, and um, and uh, the mm, um, and uh, uh, and that's that's the mathematical manifestation of collapse. Okay, and actually, if you go back to Previous slide, and say you know if you if you take this uh, if you take this relation uh, that you know, s separates collapsing from non-collapsing in a classical problem, and now say that on the semi-classical level, uh, I'm going to set angular momentum equal to h bar because that's the fundamental unit of angular momentum. Uh, then we'll get the same condition. We'll get uh, we'll get z critical equal to h bar c over e square, which is 137. So so there is. Uh, so this classical uh, classical analysis predicts the same uh, threshold for for collapse. Uh, 
Uh, please ask questions if we, you know, if, if there are questions, if it's, you know. Don't ask if it's boring. Right. Um, so, yeah, so, uh, right, so then what, what, what happens if z is greater than 137? Uh, can z be, become greater than 137? Well, so the, the periodic, periodic uh, system of elements that, as we know it now, goes up to z equal 118 or something like that. Uh, so it's not reaching 137, but, you know, getting pretty close. So there is definitely a reason to be uh, to be worried about what will happen if we produce an atom with z, uh, z which will be greater than this number. And, and of course, people uh, people worried about it back then, and um, there was a lot of discussion uh, and work. And uh, the important so there were a few important steps that I will mention. I mean, m many distinguished people contributed into this, and in fact, you know, th this this this. Uh, um, this problem somehow was a central problem in atomic physics community over over many over several de decades, and many distinguished people, in particular those who took part in in atomic effort and uh, in 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 the Soviet Union and also in the U.S., uh, contributed to this problem and. Uh, and so it was a high-profile problem where you know battles were fought about and lots of interesting literature generated. So I'm not going to give you a full summary of it, but the, the, the important things, uh, the important things that people said, uh, most important things were, were the following. So, so the first uh, first observation uh, um, was made uh, in this paper by Pomeranchuk and Smarodinsky, and they so they. Consider what happens if if the one of our singularity of Coulomb potential is smeared on a nuclear scale. So nuclear scale is very small compared to the radius of atomic orbit. It is at least uh, you know three orders of magnitude, you know four orders of magnitude smaller. Um, so you would think that you know things happening on that sm small scale don't matter. However, however it turned out and you know somewhat surprising. Uh, even now, that if you if you modify potential on the sm on a scale which is so small, uh, you get a big change. Your your uh, Dirac operator uh, continues to be Hermitian even if you increase z above 137, and all eigenvalues continue to be re real. And then um, they so what will happen as a function of, of z nuclear charge, non-dimensionalized nuclear charge, is that they will you know they will move down. And eventually, the lowest eigenvalue will be the first to dive down, dive into the negative Dirac, uh, Dirac Fermi C, and this happens at z equal 170. But before that, uh, nothing pathological. Uh, the collapse is completely cured by by this regularization at very small uh, small length scale, and we'll come back to that later. Uh, it will be important part of of, of our story. Uh, and then the true collapse. In you know in, in 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 the case of massive electron, the true collapse occurs when z is, is equal to 170. Uh, then at this point, the discrete level goes in the negative Dirac continuum, and then at this point, the hydrogen atom loses um, loses discrete states, and instead becomes you know the ground state becomes strongly hybridized with continuum, and so you know we, we get a completely different kind of. Um, Kind of atomic um, state, uh, and uh, so that's that's the threshold of uh, true threshold of true collapse. Uh, and then another question, next question one can pose is what happens in the supercritical state when z is hundred greater than 170? Uh, now 170 is clearly out of reach from the periodic table point of view because you know doesn't even go to 137. Uh, so that's way out. And so the question is what happens there and can we actually can we actually realize that? And so and the next next generation of people worked on on that and, and, and another group of very uh, very famous famous people uh, and understood 
a few things. First of all, they constructed a detailed picture of how supercritical hydrogen atom looks, uh, how the state uh, that dives into continuum becomes quasi stationary, hybridized with continuum, acquires finite lifetime, and um, uh, and uh, so there is a detailed theory uh, uh, built by Gerstein, Zeldovich, also by other people, McDowell and um, and um, Marinov and you know a few, a few other people. Uh, then also there was an important contribution to that by by this gentleman Popov, who. Um, uh, who proposed a way to observe it, to observe the supercritical behavior and, you know, uh, describe it, uh, can be described as follows. You, you can, so he said, uh, l let's take two, uh, two, two nuclei which are subcritical, each of them is subcritical, and co collide them. And then during the time of collision, uh, you know, to take, to take them to be subcritical, but such that two Z, double charge is supercritical and for example uranium uh, nine, well, Z, Z98 will, you know, will satisfy that requirement. Uh, 2 times 98 is greater than 170. Uh, so co collide two uranium nuclei or something like that and then uh, for a short time during collision they will form a compound nucleus that will be supercritical and uh, then th this, uh, this supercritical nucleus will create, uh, will create, um, sorry, oh will create um, the energy level in a negative Dirac continuum. Uh, this negative energy level will grab, will grab an electron out of continuum and then the positron will fly out. So basically, basically at this point there will be a spark, spark in the vacuum and spark in the vacuum means that electron-positron pair is born and, and the electron will become localized and, and the nuclear charge will change from Z to Z minus Z 1. And, and positron will fly out. So the proposal was to uh, to look uh, to look for narrow positron emission lines in in nuclear in nuclear uh, c colliders, and um, and so these are, yeah. So that's that's a schematic of of this proposal. Uh, so this experiment has been carried out for a number of years at several several accelerator facilities. And at some point, they even claimed success and then retracted the claims. So I think the status now is that is that it has not been it has not been observed. Uh, but but um, even so, the, the, you know, the, this proposal will you know will be important to us because that that's how we th that's how we do it on Griffin. Um, so that's a, you know that's a quick review of you know all the history before. Griffin came on stage. Maybe, maybe there are some questions that we should. I mean. Yeah. No questions at all. Yeah. So it's like something goes underneath the sea and it pops out a positron at the other end. Or is that what's it happening after the collapse? So yeah. So uh, so z is changed from z to z minus one because the uh, uh, charge one. Uh, one charge Z becomes screened by one electron. And then I think what will happen if the Z minus one charge is still supercritical, then there will be another event like that. And then it will become Z minus two and then Z minus three. Uh, w what we should have in mind is that in these accelerator facilities, nuclei before they accelerated and smashed against each other, they are stripped of all their electrons, right? So they are basically naked, uh, naked nuclei. There are no electron orbitals attached to them whatsoever. Uh, so, so, so this this electron going on that quasi-stationary st state in the continuum will be would be the first one, and then you know z minus one being supercritical, then would be another one uh, z minus two, etc. Until until we come to uh, to the critical value, yeah, and then it will be stable. Yeah. Uh, other other questions? No. Right. Um, right. So, um, right. So, 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 so the interest to this problem um, renewed when 
graphene uh, came about. And the reason is that, uh, main reason is that, well, graphene has, is a condensed matter system that hosts uh, relativistic particles. Uh, and uh, that's a short review of what graphene looks like. It's a graph graphite monolayer, uh, graphite monolayer with atomic structure that looks like uh, looks like this honeycomb lattice with two two um, atoms per unit cell, and and the uh, electron orbitals are described by. Uh, by two component wave function with with amplitudes uh, spinner amplitudes corresponding to amplitudes on the two two sub lattices of uh, of the honeycomb structure uh, and the band structure looks like massless Dirac dispersion near the points near the symmetry points in the brilliant zone uh, which are the important ones for all transport properties of graphene. Uh, so near points K and K prime, you have massless direct particles. Uh, they are, um, uh, so because they're massless, they mimic uh, the dispersion of Dirac electron in the limit when, uh, when uh, the kinetic energy is much greater than mc squared, so in the ultra-relativistic limit. Um, or you can just say that, you know, mass is zero, uh, doesn't matter. Uh, the, the, there are, uh, you know, uh, so that's the, com the Hamiltonian will be Dirac Hamiltonian with zero mass, and or you can or you can start with with um, Dirac electron dispersion relation, and then uh, and then forget about mass and uh, that um, setting mass to zero in high energy physics is the same thing as making gap, energy gap between conduction band and valence band zero uh, equals zero in condensed matter language. So that's, that's the relation with, with, with Dirac particles. Uh, there are several differences. One, one, difference, uh, one difference is that the speed of light uh, will be replaced by, by the d d slope of this dispersion, the Dirac Fermi velocity, which is uh, 300 times smaller than the speed of light. Uh, and 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 b because of that, uh, because of that, these are ultra relativistic, but you know, slow fermions. Now that's important because if you now construct the fine structure constant, which which is the uh, the which is the fundamental uh, measure of the Coulomb interaction strength, uh, fine structure constant will be 300 times greater than for for Dirac electrons. So it will be. Uh, 300 divided by 137, which is a order one. I have to take maybe screening into account. So it will be it will be some number of order one, uh, and and because of that, uh, because of that, if you go through the same estimates that we went through estimating collapse threshold, you will find that uh, that the critical charge value for collapse will be of order one for for these particles simply because fine structure constant is of order one. So uh, so that's that's pretty interesting. It means that. Uh, it means that uh, we uh, we may expect to see collapse uh, for uh, for um, charge impurities with uh, w which are univalent or divalent or something like that, and uh, and uh, and so so it suddenly puts the collapse you know completely within reach. Uh, there is a slight difference here because Dirac equation you know it's a massless Dirac equation. And so it has continuum spectrum only. There are no discrete states, and so manifestations of collapse will be slightly different. Uh, slightly different. It's not the transition from discrete to continuum states, but but the, uh, uh, still, still there will be an abrupt change when you go super, from subcritical to supercritical, and there will be resonances appearing uh, in the continuum. Uh, actually, inf infinitely many of, of them, uh, and you can get them straight from Dirac solution uh, if you want. Or make a quasi-classical argument uh, if you if you don't like to solve Dirac equation. Uh, so what you can what you can do for uh, for quasi-classical argument is you can take these orbits, classical orbits that we introduced uh, earlier, and put uh, Bohr-Sommerfeld quantized wave functions on them. And if you so so if you take an orbit, for example, spiraling uh, spiraling on 
on the center and then you know put some mic microscopic put some boundary condition microscopic scale so that it doesn't doesn't spiral and definitely there's always microscopic scale uh, of order of lattice constant that uh, cannot that, that regularize the problem uh, at at sh short distances so if you take that into account you get you get a spiraling orbit uh, particle going 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 in and then reflected going out so you get uh, get a, a, a periodic and then you know coming back in again so you get a periodic periodic orbit like this if you put bohr sommerfeld uh, quantized wave function you find discrete uh, discrete real energy values uh, and you know that would be very much like a hydrogen atom however what you discover is that at the same energy at the same energy as this uh, the, the closed orbit there is an open orbit uh, by which particle can escape to infinity and so if you now take into account that you know th these orbits they occur at exactly the same angular momentum at exactly the same energy uh, nothing prohibits particles from tunneling from one to the other and th that tunneling which uh, it, uh, is called Klein tunneling so if you take if you take that into account uh, that gives a finite line, line width to a finite width to the energies that you uh, bohr sommerfeld energies uh, that you obtained here and uh, a convenient way to represent it is to uh, draw energy as a complex number with real uh, real value being uh, the one obtained from bohr sommerfeld quantization and the imaginary part corresponding to inverse life you know, half of the inverse life lifetime uh, and then if you put it on complex plane, what you discover is that uh, you acquire, you know, immediately after you cross the collapse threshold, you acquire an infinite family of these complex energy resonances uh, in, in, in the complex plane. And an imaginary part of complex energy means that it's a quasi-stationary decaying state, not, uh, not confined, but, uh, but with a finite lifetime exactly what we ex expect in the super supercritical collapse regime. And they, so they form an infinite series appearing all at once if you exceed collapse threshold. Beta, sorry, beta is uh, the ratio of Z nuclear charge E squared divided by V, uh, V uh, instead of C, the Dirac, uh, Dirac Fermi velocity. So it's the same thing as zeta, but before, but with speed of light replaced by, by Dirac Fermi velocity. Okay, um, so, and, and a threshold one half instead of one is because we are now in dimensionality two rather than in dimensionality one. C collapse threshold is twice lower because kinetic energy doesn't play such an important role in two dimensions as potential energy, so that, that's a that's factor of two reduction. Uh, but otherwise it's the same story. Uh, so so that's, that's the quasi-classical analysis you get exactly the same result if you just solve Dirac equation um, um, or, or simply look up solution in a textbook uh, you get you get quasi stationary states of that structure immediately infinitely many of them immediately after you cross <coughs> collapse threshold uh, and so that's that's the transition we are uh, we're interested in uh, now how to observe it uh, the easiest way to observe quasi stationary states is with perhaps with uh, with a local scanning probe, a local spectroscopic scanning probe like uh, a STM, and one can uh, one can calculate uh, local density of states maps and show how they uh, how they differ in the subcritical regime. So here, beta is 0.4, critical value is 0.5. So we are you know 80 percent of critical, but but th there is there is no sign of resonances. What you see, I mean, the color scale is density of states. Uh, blue means low density of states, and uh, it lowest at here the direct point, and you know, uh, red means high density of states. So here it's red because some some carriers are pulled on, uh, pulled on, um, pulled on uh, one of our uh, potential. And then when you go supercritical, uh, you start seeing resonances. So there are these energies near which near which density of states is enhanced and then they have spatial extent going out away from from um, from impurity uh, by a distance which is of order uh, one over uh, one over energy so energy energy and localization radius scale inversely with each other and then if you continue to increase nuclear charge you you know 
you see the second resonance, and then the third one, uh, etc. Right. So that's that's the so that that so, so that was the proposal, uh, and. But so what these experiments or just simulation of? This is simulation. Yeah. So this okay. is th 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 these are these papers from 2007, okay. uh, in which you know we, we proposed that, and I will come to experiments shortly. Um, so. So these are, I mean, if you're curious, these are Friedel oscillations from, you know, a reflection from interference from impurity. Uh, and there are various other features that we can discuss. Uh, so, yeah, so it's, it's from, you know, it's from, from this paper. Um, so, so then, you know, this proposal was, uh, was uh, further developed in several ways. Uh, first of all, there is an issue you know, what exactly is collapse threshold in, in particular, uh, in particular, if we start taking vacuum polarization effects into account. Vacuum polarization effects are, are interesting in the supercritical regime because they are, you know, they become, uh, they become strong and, and uh, they're also interesting in, in atomic physics, but they're even more interesting and more, more important in condensed matter system because fine structure constant is bigger. Uh, and so in, you know, in condensed matter, it's called screening. Uh, and so the screening cloud that forms because charge is being pulled on, uh, pulled on from Dirac Fermi C, pulled on the impurity charge, may, may renormalize the, and does renormalize uh, um, the impurity uh, pot potential. And so the question is, what's the effect of that? And there have been you know, a lot of discussion in literature, some people Saying that that z is uh, z remains of order one, z critical remains of order one, but just you know increases by by a factor of order one. Some people saying that critical charge becomes much greater than one. Some people saying that critical charge is pushed to infinity because screening is too strong. Uh, so so this you know there is debate uh, to some extent still going on. Uh, and would be going on forever if 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 it wouldn't be you know done experimentally. Uh, then another interesting topic is uh, you know connection to high energy physics because you know, it's it's interesting to it's interesting to uh, tr try and understand uh, try to understand how this is connected to uh, relativistic particles at strong strong fine structure coupling. Uh, and uh, lastly, an interesting question that I, I, I'll try to say something about is whether this transition from non-collapsing to collapsing state is a, um, is a symmetry breaking transition. W whether, uh, whether these are two regimes which are distinguished by symmetry or are they like a uh, transition from liquid to gas where you have uh, states with two different, uh, with different physical parameters, densities, uh, entropies, etc., but but not 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 different from each other by symmetry, and so I will try to argue that some symmetry breaking does take place. Uh, so yeah, so okay. So meanwhile, while while theorists were debating debating uh, these these issues, um, experiment has been done, uh, basically replicating this idea from nuclear physicists, from atomic physicists, that we have to start with with um, with subcritical charges and build. A compound nucleus, which which would be supercritical, and so this is uh, this is Mike Cromie, uh, University of Berk Berkeley, looking at the atomic collapse uh, on the screen of his computer, um, and um, more on that later. And I'll skip this slide. So so what they what they have done, you know, it's it's very it's a very difficult experiment, uh, and there are many details that they don't understand, but basically. Uh, basically, they, you know, they, they, they learned how to use STM tip to manipulate uh, manipulate charge impurities on the surface, and a stabilize them, and b after they are stabilized, uh, push on them gently so that they can be brought uh, brought together, and and uh, even after they are brought together, and remember, uh, each of them is charged, so they are repelling each other, but they are binding to crystal lattice. Is stronger than repulsion, and it stabilizes stabilizes these uh, these uh, three three charged uh, o o objects, uh, and they don't go away for several hours. So we have time to uh, to do uh, to do 
experiment, and you know, it, it, it's a little bit like this idea of, uh, of overcoming critical threshold by, coll by co colliding subcritical nuclei, except that the time we get to do experiment here is much longer than, you know, than, than the short collision time in this case. Mm. So, um, yeah, if you have any questions about anything, please ask. I will be happy to get into more detail on a anything you want. Uh, so, yeah, so, uh, uh, right, so uh, the experiment that was done uh, was nuclear, sorry, was, a, was spectroscopy um, map taken at different distances of the charge impurity. And, and so for one charge impurity, what you see is, is shown here. So we park our STM tip at dif <coughs> different distances, uh, different distances, uh, you know, five different distances, and take uh, varying bias on the tip, take, uh, take a spectroscopic map of our, of our system at one particular location. And this is what we get. So this is, you know, th this is a complicated structure. Uh, what you shouldn't pay attention here is this deep. This deep, this deep has nothing to do with a with, um, system we're investigating. It's just a property of the tip. It's there in all their measurements. And it's, uh, it, it's known where it comes from. It's featured due to optical phonon. Uh, it's nothing to do to collapse. So, so what you should do is ignore the steep. Take, take, take this branch of the spectrum, translate it by this vector, and, and think about it as a V-shape, uh, V-shape density of states that looks like this. Um, and then what you see here is that as we approach the nucleus, uh, V-shape of state, uh, V-shape density of states continues to be V-shape. It just becomes slightly asymmetric and becomes, you know, then more asymmetric as we come closer to impurity. And this is exactly what you, I mean, if you remember those uh, spectroscopy maps that I drew, uh, that I plotted, uh, th that was exactly what was going on in the subcritical regime, uh, V-shaped density of states, which is typical for direct particles, would be symmetric away from uh, charge impurity, as, and then as we approach charge impurity, it would skew on one side. And uh, from how quickly it's, it, it becomes asymmetric as a function of distance, uh, you can actually determine the value of the charge uh, as seen by electrons in the material, so including all the screening and, and whatnot. Uh, the true charge value with all with all screen effects taken into account can be can be inferred for how the asymmetry increases as you approach the nucleus and and we and, and we, we, we've done that and um, and uh, and then these results can be used to interpret uh, what happens if you build two two impurity three impurity four impurity etc cluster so when you go to when you go to two impurities, you basically see the same thing. You know, V-shape becomes slightly, uh, slightly curved over here. When you go to n equal three, uh, you see you see a resonance that appears on this side, uh, and then when you go to n equal four, you see that this resonance sharpens and moves moves down in energy, and when you go to n equal five, another resonance starts to appear. And so so this resonance doesn't doesn't go away. New resonance comes in, and th th that's exactly what you expect. Uh, if you you know if you think how how coexistationary states behave as you increasing uh, increasing nuclear charge and so we you know at this point uh, it looks pretty convincing that th this is indeed uh, this is indeed collapse uh, and you can also do I mean you can do modeling you can take this uh, nuclear charge value determined from uh, from one impurity experiment and then uh, and then using that without any fitting with any other fitting parameters you can describe uh, tunneling density of states for uh, for all these curves just from solving solving two-dimensional Dirac equation uh, and so here are the results and looks looks pretty similar and so that that, uh, so is that a measure of makes in plane in graphene? so the critical so the charge value charge value uh, for one impurity is different from one, is, is different from one, and uh, we can discuss how different, and that, that's the measure of screening. And then with this, with this value, which is 
measured from this asymmetry, we can, without any, without any additional uh, parameters, we can simply, we can triple it or quintuple it and, and calculate density of states for, uh, for, for these cases and, uh, and find that uh, in this case it's 1.4 of critical value uh, that Dirac equation predicts and indeed so here you know here see some resonances so so yeah so so it looks looks pretty good um, it also I mean one can also you know uh, do a bit more detailed study one can take one can take a CMT par park it on sorry park it on uh, park it on the resonance and then measure the spatial map. So the spatial map will tell you about the structure of quasi-stationary state, and that's oh, that's here. Uh, and so, well, a you see that quasi-stationary ex state extends very far from far beyond the size of the cluster. Th th that's important because uh, because there've been other you know confined quasi-confined states seen in experiments where you put charge impurities on the surface, for example, those famous uh, electron corralled states that you know, people studied in IBM some 15 years ago, Don Eigler, etc. And so there you can put charge impurities in the ring and confine electron inside. And so, uh, so a natural question to ask is, you know, whether, whether this is something similar. And so this proves that it, it is not because because the confined states, you know, the spatial distribution uh, is mostly outside, not inside, the impurities that confine it, right? So, so it's not it's not a corral state. Also, you can compare, you know, compare density, you know, position dependence with theory and you know, reasonably good agreement. So, so that that also looks pretty good. And so, so at this point, we are, you know, we are convinced that. Uh, th this is a collapsing state. I mean, th this depends on gating. Let me skip this. M may maybe a little bit for questions because this, this is for uh, this is for specialists. So, so this you know th this concludes first part of this talk. Maybe if there are any questions, let's ask them now. I have one question. I think in the beginning you said that the critical depth depends very much on how distributed the nuclear charge is. Yeah. In this case here, you don't have really a 1 over R potential as your charges are distributed, they are above the, the graphene plane, so the potential will be 1 over R. Potential. Yeah, no, th thank you, yeah, so, so th thank you for, uh, for, for asking about this. So, so I haven't talked about l length scales at all, so, so let's, let's, let's talk about length scales. So, uh, so the length scales are that the characteristic scale for, for what's going on is you know, five, ten nanometers, and and atom size is uh, is uh, you know 0 0.1, 0 0.2 nanometer, right? I mean, th these the, the the objects look fuzzy; they're more fuzzy than than the atoms. That's because these are dimers, not not uh, not single atom impurities, and dimers dimers on the surface they undergo zero point motion, so they uh, they're like you know. They rotate, and so the, the, there's some zero point motion that makes them fuzzy. But so, so they are, you know, they are atomic scale basically, and they sit right, uh, right, right on the surface. So, uh, so, so with that, I can say that uh, that maybe I mean maybe this is a bit extreme. But if I go here, so if I go here, uh, the size of my uh, potential is is about a nanometer, and and uh, the uh, experiment is done on a scale at least ten times bigger. So that's that's the length scale. Uh, that's the scale difference between between electron orbital and uh, and and the radius at which one of our potential is truncated. But then, when you increase the cluster size, it becomes rather large. It becomes mm -hmm. five nanometers. Yeah. So that's why they don't go beyond that. I think they. I mean, they they stop somewhere here. Uh, I mean, so th there's still maybe a factor of three uh, between electron wave function and 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 the, uh, and and the radius. And in order to make sure that you know no nothing pathological happens, they th 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 that's precisely why they did this. They wanted to to be sure that the wave function mostly um, sits outside. So if you compute 
normalization, you will see that normalization is mostly due to the outer part, not due to the inner part. Right? So, so we, can, we can effectively think about this as a, a regularized one over our potential. Uh, I mean, there's no four orders of magnitude like for hydrogen atom, it's only one order of magnitude, but you know, have to live with this. Um, so, yeah, but yeah, thank you, that, that's, a, that's a good, good point. Um, any, any other questions? Hmm? Ten minutes. Ten minutes, yeah. excellent. Right. So, okay, so let me try um, in, in, in the last ten minutes uh, and, and uh, make, um, make the case for symmetry breaking. And, uh, and, and the symmetry breaking in this case will be scaling symmetry. So let me quickly remind you what scaling symmetry is. Uh, it is, uh, you know, we learn it usually first time when we learn about shapes. And shapes can be, uh, shapes can be similar, uh, different size, but similar, similar in, in appearance and in angles, etc. And so similar shapes, uh, areas scale as squares of distances. So if I double the length, I quadrupled area. And, um, and um, so that's, that's the simplest example of, of scaling relation uh, that arises from scaling symmetry. Um, and even, I mean, even on this simple level, uh, you can, you know, build something non-trivial. And to r convince you or remind you, uh, let me let me talk about an application of scaling symmetry to uh, to deriving a non-trivial relation. That's the Pythagoras uh, theorem. Uh, so there are many ways to prove it. Uh, the one the one based on scaling symmetry is as follows: you take you take your triangle with 90 degrees angle over here, and then you drop the normal uh, on the long side. Then the normal divides it into two smaller triangles that have, you, you can see they have s angles identical to the angles of the big triangle because the angles are the same, all triangles are similar. And because they're similar, uh, their areas scale as squares of the, of the lengths. And so you can, s you can write uh, the area of the big triangle as the square of the long side equal to the area of the sum of the areas of the small triangles, which is the square of their long sides, and they will be short sides of this triangle. Uh, so you get this relation and then and then the prefactor we could compute if we knew, you know, if we remembered our trigonometry, would be some function of the angles here. But it's not very important what it is. So even if you forgot your trigonometry, it's okay because the angles are the same. So these prefactors are going to be identical for all these three triangles. So you can write this re relation with some prefactor that you don't really care about. And then because it's the same everywhere, you can just drop it. And after you drop it, uh, you get your, you know, your uh, Pythagoras uh, theorem, right? So that's um, very simple, but you know, effective usage of scaling symmetry, right? You're Okay with that, right? Uh, so now going to our problem, uh, we're going to do basically the same thing here, and say that our Hamiltonian, uh, which is the sum of massless Dirac kinetic energy and negative one of our potential energy, uh, has scaling symmetry because because <coughs> gradient operator has the same scaling property as one of our potential, and if I if I scale uh, lengths and scale energy inversely with that, uh, the Hamiltonian won't change. And so that, that's a scaling symmetry and the invariant of that symmetry transformation is the ratio of, of, of the prefactor here and the prefactor here. And that's my, uh, that's my uh, fine structure constant. Uh, so what are the consequences? The consequences are many. Uh, one consequence is that uh, if, I, if I think of some observable which is dimensionless, like scattering phase, then scattering phase uh, for this problem must be energy independent because I can always change energy by rescaling from any value to any other value. But because, because I have symmetry, uh, the observable shouldn't change. So that, that means that, that, means that uh, this observable will be, will be energy independent. Dimensionless observable, such as scattering phase, will be 
will be energy independent, uh, dimension full observables uh, will scale, and I can infer how they scale directly from scaling symmetry. And if you go through analysis of you know scattering phases, transport cross section, uh, assuming scattering is by Coulomb impurities, then then you get scaling for for example for conductivity, which is linear in density, and that's that's incidentally what 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 graphene. Uh, what graphene does. I mean, there is slight nonlinearity, but in most cases, it's it's pretty linear in density. Uh, whether whether it's directly related or not, or it, it is is debated. But but that, that's an example of scaling relation that you derive from uh, from scaling symmetry. Uh, and so all that you know, good, good news indicating that we are on 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 the right track. However. Uh, however, uh, because there is, uh, because all observables are energy independent, uh, we don't expect any resonances here, and so no collapse. So if if we have scaling symmetry, if we have scaling symmetry, uh, we are guaranteed to have no you know n no collapsing behavior, just from from symmetry, all right? And so that's th that means that collapsing behavior is related to scaling symmetry breaking. Now this breaking is is an interesting kind of breaking because it you know it, 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 it is very much like it's not a spontaneous symmetry breaking like you have in phase transitions. It's uh, it's it, it's a breaking that appears for a subtle uh, for a subtle reason because we uh, we you know, uh, you know uh, m many examples that are known by now which are of that of that kind when when you have take a quantum theory and then a symmetry that exists in a classical theory breaks when you when you define quantum theory by regularizing it at short distances, and so, so it's you know it's, uh, this this type of symmetry breaking due to transition from classical to quantum uh, description is 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 known as anomaly in quantum physics, and there are various uh, various anomalies known: uh, chiral, conformal, gauge anomaly, also scaling anomaly. And so they are all, you know, each of them is is important in its own way in high energy physics. Uh, in particular, scaling anomaly uh, has been discussed a lot in, in the context of of uh, of uh, theory of strong interactions and how they produce uh, how they uh, how they produce confinement of fermions such as such as quarks. And I uh, so in particular, there is a very insightful work on that uh, that has been done by by Vladimir Gribov in the 80s. Uh, who basically used so, so same same ideas as what we discussed, quasi bound states formed by supercritical uh, supercritical um, interaction by gauge fields in this case, but they 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 one of our fields basically with some time uh, time delay uh, uh, transmitted by gluons. Um, so 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 he discussed it as a, as an origin of quark. Uh, quark confinement and whether or not this is uh, this is the correct theory of quark confinement. It's uh, you know it's an application of scaling anomaly uh, of the same kind as we're discussing he here uh, to a high energy physics problem, and uh, and both and both counts you know the change of spectrum in a global way so that your your introduced regularization on short uh, length scale, but but the entire energy spectrum changes both at high energies and low energies down to zero energy. Uh, so both that and, bo and the bound state formation is exactly the same as, as in our problem. And so, so there is a clear relation here and some, some connection. Some connection. Uh, I could also argue that our anomaly is somewhat more interesting than, than the one discussed, than scale anomaly discussed in high energy physics because we have a knob to control it. We, we have a knob which is nuclear charge, and tuning that we can go from from uh, a state where scale invariance is unbroken, the subcritical state, to the, to the state where scale invariance is broken, the supercritical state. And so that uh, you know th that 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 case. So, so, so we have a tunable, tunable or switchable anomaly, and knob controlling that is is nuclear charge. Right, and so yeah, so we can maybe skip the details and uh, and uh, how resonances appear. So maybe I'll just say that if you're in a subcritical regime, then scattering phases that you compute indeed show no energy dependence, and when you go supercritical, 
then you acquire kinks in the scattering phase energy dependence. Those kinks are those resonances. Uh, and so you can see that directly from solving Dirac equation. You can also compute behavior on tr transport cross-section and see that indeed there are, uh, behaves in two different ways in, in two regimes. Uh, so, so, so far I've been just reinterpreting what I told you in the first part in, in terms of anomaly. And then the last thing I want to discuss is whether we can, based on this new understanding, whether we, we can invent a, a direct probe of scaling symmetry. And, um, and so, uh, so we need a knob for that. And a, a knob that I'm going to use is magnetic field. So I'm going to add magnetic field to my magnetic field, uh, uniform magnetic field to my Hamiltonian. So it, it's done by uh, changing derivative to a long derivative by adding a, a vector potential to it. And, uh, and uh, then w once I do that, I no longer have scale invariance because, uh, because scaling symmetry here will change this scaling transformation will change this term. Uh, what I acquire instead is a length scale, which is magnetic length, and an energy scale. Energy scale will be Dirac Fermi velocity times square root of b in suitable units. And so, uh, so that uh, combined with scaling symmetry um, predicts that all energies in this problem will scale as this one and all length scales will scale as this one, because basically there is no other energy scale that you can build, uh, or simply if you take b equal to zero, then there is no characteristic energy scale in the problem, and there is no characteristic, characteristic length in the problem because of scaling symmetry. Uh, and so that, you know, th th this is demonstrated here for one particle Hamiltonian, but also if you, if you go to a many-body Hamiltonian, because interactions are predominantly of one of our form, uh, this, th these conclusions will still be true. So, so all length scales are expected to behave like that, and all energy scales are expected to behave like, like square root b. So if we have scaling symmetry, we expect to have a square root b scaling in uh, anything. Okay, so let's leave that for questions. So people, people, people actually, you know, without Putting it in this, uh, without putting it in this language, people actually tested the square root b dependence uh, in optical transitions in graphene, and uh, so this is the first data, and then those the data, uh, a better data later. But mostly people find that that uh, the, the square root dependence uh, is is um, is uh, is obeyed, uh, and. So that would be a you know, case for scaling symmetry being present and interactions in graphene being not too strong to drive graphene into a supercritical state just by itself. You need to put, to put a charge charge impurity to that. So that's, that's fine. Uh, but in, in order to see how it happens with charge impurity, let me show you a little simulation that I did for just for this talk. So, so we'll take, take that Hamiltonian that we introduced, one of our potential, negative one of our potential was charge z. Uh, and apply magnetic field and then plot energy levels as a function of b, uh, as a function of square root of b. And so first we did it, uh, we do it for zero impurity charge, ju just as a sanity check. And in this case, in, in this case, what we get are uh, Dirac Landau levels, which uh, are particle hole symmetric, and there is a zero energy state. And so these are, you know, uh, well known, uh, well known energy levels and we reproduce them so we are uh, not um, we, are, we are doing okay now if we put uh, if we make impurity charge uh, non-zero and in fact equal 80 percent of critical value then the energy levels change as you can see here but they, they continue to scale with b with square root linearly with square root b as you would expect from scaling symmetry and and then if you take a supercritical charge, uh, take a supercritical charge, then as soon as you go supercritical, you see deviations from square root b scaling, and that's, that's a, you know, th that's a sign uh, of scaling symmetry being violated. So that's, you know, th that's a direct test. I mean, nice thing is that this is a direct test of whether scaling symmetry is present or not present. And uh, what so so the proposal is to take sub, uh, to take you know the, the system that we um, that w was introduced experimentally uh, and uh, applying magnetic field to it 
look at look at um, how energy levels um, scale or do not scale, and th th that will show presence of breaking or of scaling symmetry. All right. So okay. So that's that's I think the end of it. Uh, so the B field magnetic fields can be used as a knob to test presence or absence as a litmus test for uh, scaling symmetry or its absence, and therefore for you know associated quantum anomaly. Um, and um, uh, and on a more general, I mean, one can also discuss other other knobs uh, that one can introduce. But on a more general level, so what we have here, you know, summarizing, uh, is that we uh, we have uh, an experimental system in graphene that allows us to probe the you know fundamental issues of stability of matter um, that have been uh, bothering atomic physicists for a long time, uh, and also what we understand now is that is that um, this transition from non-collapsing to collapsing state is related to uh, scaling symmetry and and its breaking, and uh, so that I think is you know, pretty nice. It, it explains in particular why in this Pomeranchuk paper small scales was so important because regularization introduced on some uh, seemingly irrelevant length scale mattered for all energy scales. And th th that's very typical for anomalous symmetry breaking. You regularize, and doesn't matter on what length scale you regularize, behavior change changes for, for the entire energy domain. And so that, that's, what we, th that's what we have in, in this regime also. Thank you. Thank you, Levita.